Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's episode 51 in our Navigating Turbulent Times series, um, introducing the NEC4 Facilities Management Contract. I'm Anne Kinder. I'm Senior Consultant at Noda Solutions Limited, a specialist FM consultancy. And I was asked to host this session not just because I'm the chair of the procurement specialist interest group, but I also had pleasure in being in a, a, a contributor to the FMC. So the launch of the NEC for FM contract, it's a celebration of several years work. Um, so I was really excited about yesterday's launch and I'm keen to share with people the work that's gone into the project both before and during the drafting. Uh, Linda House-Mamis, the CEO of IWFN, presented at yesterday's launch at the NEC user conference. And she, said, she shared the collaborative journey that brought us to this point. So in this webinar today, we're going to be looking at what the contract is, the rationale behind it, and the benefits that we hope everyone will enjoy in our sector. We're going to discuss some of the new concepts, such as a service order and the performance table. And we'll explore how we think this contract is going to help change the way in which FM services are procured. So I'm really pleased to be joined by a panel of experts who have intimate knowledge, not only of the contract, but also its development. And in the first part of the webinar, we're going to be running through the new contract with the panel. And then for the second part, it's your opportunity to ask the panel questions about the contract. The questions are open now, so please feel free to start adding to those. Um, if you want to remain anonymous, please just add anon, A-N-O-N, to the front of your question. So on a personal note, before I introduce the panel, I'm really pleased that we've got to this point. Um, I've been assist, I was assisted in the, the drafting of the contract and worked closely with Ross Hayes and also Ben Walker on the clauses of the main contract. And we had many hours of debate and discussions on how to provide the best solutions for the FM community and the range of services that we provide. However, in a way, this is just the start of another journey, one where we need to promote the FMC within our sector to ensure that we achieve the many benefits that we're going to hear about shortly. So today I'm joined by Andy Candelant. Andy's the Head of Facilities Management at LEADEC and also was a member of the IWFM Steering Group and the International Special Interest Group. Ian Heafy, the Director of In Construction Consultancy and NEC Contract Board Member. And Chris Jeffers, Director and Head of Facilities Management Advisory at M M Mott McDonald um, and a member of the IWFM Steering Group and also um, a member of the Procurement Special Interest Group. So before we get into our discussion, um, I'd just like each of the panel members to say a few words about their contribution to the FM contract. Andy, if I could start with you, please. Great, thank you, Anne. Um, my name's Andy Candelant. Um, I've been in facilities management for um, over 20 years. I'm currently head of facilities management for LEDEC, a specialist provider of FM and other support services for the manufacturing sector. Um, I was lucky enough to be involved with the development of the contract from the very start uh, back in 2017 with my fellow committee member, Philip Kennedy. I was asked to initiate a committee to realise the output from the 2016 ISIG FM Leaders Forum, which identified a need for an international FM contract. Um, a small working group was formed and it quickly became evident that um, the requirement for a fit for purpose contract didn't just relate to the international sector, but was required at national level as well. Um, so the, the working group put a recommendation to what was then BIFM in early 2018. 
And then later in 2018, I was asked to become a member of the IWFM steering group. So I am very pleased that after several years' work, this contract is now coming to market. Thank you, Andy. Ian, how about <clears throat> yourself? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as has been mentioned, my name's Ian Heafy. I'm a member of the NEC4 contract board. So I was involved in drafting the NEC4 suite of contracts released in 2017. As a development of that, I then got involved working with IWFM on developing an FM specific version of the NEC contracts. And I was part of the team working with Anne, Ross, Ben, Peter Higgins and others, developing the content of the contracts, helping to put them together and particularly focusing on a sort of an NEC, not compliance, but an NEC um, consistency perspective to make sure it tallied with the other NEC contracts and approaches but still was able to build in the specific requirements of the FM community. Thank you, Ian. And Chris. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Chris Jeffers, I'm an FM consultant, as Anne has mentioned, at Mott McDonald. And this is a really, really proud and important moment for us. And as Andy and Anne have said, we, we've been on this journey for quite some time. Our industry, we might well touch on as we go through today's presentation has had various forms, various approaches to the FM contract over the years, none of which I think we probably all accept have been 100% successful for various reasons. And this is a really, I think, a, a bit of a turning point, a bit of a watershed moment in our industry. We have a contract now that is understood and agreed by adjacent practices and adjacent disciplines across our industry. Uh, NEC is very well placed. And we have something that we, can look forward to embedding and trusting in terms of both the client and the provider and to understand how the contract works, uh, what the benefits are and how both relations or both parties can really benefit from it. So I think this is a really, really important moment and, and I'm, I'm really keen to be involved in it, really happy to be involved in it and uh, I look forward to the session ahead. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. So um, in terms of our panel discussion, if I could start with yourself, Ian, please. You, you mentioned in your, in your introduction that it's not just a single contract, it's a, a full contract suite. Could you tell us what's being provided and for what services, please? Okay, so yeah, absolutely. The contracts have been produced to form a comprehensive suite to allow the main players in delivery of M to be engaged on consistent terms and conditions. So we have the FMC, the Facilities Management Contract, if you like, the main contract form used by a client, a, a, a demander of services to engage a service provider to provide FM services of any nature, anywhere in the world. It's designed to be used across borders within different geographies. And so that is used for a number of different FM models, but the idea being you're appointing a principal service provider to provide the services to the client, the demand organization. We then have a subcontract version of that, and that is designed to engage major subcontractors, providing a part of the overall service. And we've used the term subcontractor there to describe that organization, reflecting that they are, a, you know, the next tier in the supply chain. And those contracts are pretty similar in content and form, allowing the obligations, the requirements, the processes to be flowed along the supply chain. We've then produced a facilities management short contract. And as the name would suggest, it's a shorter simplified version of the full contract designed for lower risk, lower complexity services to be provided, hopefully making it more accessible to organizations maybe of a smaller scale, allowing SMEs to be engaged under simpler terms, but still keeping the fundamental processes necessary. And then we have a facilities management short subcontract. So a subcontract that, that a subcontractor can be used with either the full contract or the short contract, allowing subcontractors who are providing maybe a smaller part of the service, a 
simpler, lower risk part of the service to be engaged on a contract that reflects their involvement, their risks, their responsibilities. In addition, we've produced six user guides and those user guides take you through the journey from developing your procurement and contract strategy through into preparing an FMC, an FMS or a short contract, then into supplier selection, guidance around how that can be undertaken and then user guides to support the operation of the contracts. So to give users um, hands-on advice, if you like practical advice about how the contract should be put together, how they should be operated, giving examples of communications, dealing with scenarios, um, helping people hopefully pick up these contracts and run with them fairly quickly, providing a lot of background and support for them. Super, so, so really comprehensive. And for those of us who are familiar with the existing NEC contracts, what are the key features that have been retained from the contracts? I suppose that the fundamental objectives of all NEC contracts around clarity and simplicity, around being flexible, allowing it to be used for different types of services in different locations, and also trying to stimulate good contract management. So those three overriding principles of all NEC contracts feature within the FM contracts. We've also retained practices such as the early warning process. We looked at ways of still encouraging value engineering and savings to be um, suggested by the supplier. And also, looking at some of the requirements around the compensation event process, retaining that structured, comprehensive mechanism of getting things dealt with as and when they happen. So a lot of those core procedures have been retained, but others have been tweaked or modified to reflect the demands of the FM industry. And we're going to touch on those later in the discussion. Absolutely. Thank you. So has it been designed for any specific um, service delivery approach or FM format in the market or does it cover the range of um, service delivery? So the intent is it can be used for the range of service delivery, possibly supplemented by some of the other NEC contracts within the suite. So maybe if there's going to be a consultancy organisation engaged in a management function, they could be engaged under the professional services contract already present within the NEC4 suite or the professional services short contract. But for the organizations actually providing the service, we have the FMC, the FMSC, uh, the short contract, and they're designed to be relatively flexible uh, with the secondary options, the flexibility around things like the performance table and such like we'll talk about later, allowing it to be used within these different delivery models. And it's something we did look at at the start and whether Chris or Andy can comment on this, that we did look at this at the start around the different delivery models and making sure that we had the contracts would work within those. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. You want me to just support that, Anne, just, just quickly? We absolutely did, Ian. Yeah, that's right. Um, we know, and I'll probably touch on it when we talk a little bit about the performance table, that one of the challenges within FM is, of course, every client and every organisation has different requirements. Um, that is something that can be quite difficult to try and formalise in a, in a structure, in a contract structure. So we've tried to make it flexible. NEC contract is flexible by its nature. And we've tried to put into the, particularly into the guidance notes, some supporting information around whatever the type or form of contract that you're looking at, there is a particular approach that we'd advocate and take. Um, but but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the KPIs and the approach for that a little bit later on. But yes, it, it's, it's something that we really did look at in the early stages of the project. Thank you both. Thank you. And we're going to be talking a little bit later on about how people can, can access the, the suite of contracts. But Andy, I wanted to go back. Uh, you mentioned in the introduction a bit about the genesis of the, the idea for the contract. And I was looking back, it goes back to 2016, uh, where the idea emerged through um, your work with the International Special Interest Group. That's right, isn't it? That's right, and as I, as I um, said in my brief intro, um, the 
FM Leaders Forum in 2016 identified a need for an international form of contract. Um, we formed a working group to um, implement that some recommendation and we quickly found that actually the lack of suitable co um, contract documentation was across the board rather than just international context. Um, in early 2018, as I've said, the working group reported to BIFM and recommended not only that um, a standard form of contract was developed, but also given the complexity of the uh, task that IWFM work with a um, specialist partner to realize that ambition. Um, 2018 was also significant in the FM industry um, for other reasons. Um, obviously, the collapse of Carillion occurred, which highlighted uh, procurement and contract management practices, which were common at the time, and the need for culture change and improved practice. Um, what was then BIFM also signed a memor memorandum of understanding with NEC in that year. And a joint NEC and IWFM survey in 2018 showed that the existing TSC and other forms of contract um, didn't really address the, address the diverse range of needs in the FM market. So in 2018, a steering group was formed um, by um, IWFM volunteers and NEC to develop a new contract, um, which has ultimately led to the publication in January, or the pre-publication in January this year of um, the FM contract and subcontract and some of the user guides. And then yesterday, obviously, the full publication of the long and short versions of the contract, uh, the suite of six volumes of user guidance, and plus also to come the series of topic-based practice notes, which are in the pipeline. Super, thank you. And and Chris, if I could ask you, please, we Andy's explained about the the why we we thought we needed it, and what's the relevance today? Do you think that's changed or? <laughs> I think it does. Yeah, I, I think it, it builds on on where we've come from as an industry, and I think where we are now. So, irrespective of, of twenty twenty and everything that, that's been going on there, and where FM has been a lot more front and centre in terms of what people's minds are. I, I think the, the realisation of how important FM services are to an organisation is it's reached that tipping point. And so to have a contract that represents the industry, I think is really important. I think not only just for um, reputation and for, uh, for recognition, but I think it's a really important tool to get the relationship right between the client and the provider um, and something that, again, we'll probably touch on as we go through today. But we, invariably, that's been an issue through the history of FM. It's, of course, in other industries as well, but particularly where a service is being provided and not just an end to end product or transactional relationship, but more of a service, more of a people based relationship. So I think it really is timely. I think also we have the, the great work that's been done around the ISO standard 41,011 and all the work that's going on in that space, that is also raising the profile and raising the importance of, of uh, the work that we do. So a really good time, I think, to have a contract that uh, sets, sets out very clearly how the relationship works between the parties, what the risks are, um, and gives us that framework so that we can actually deliver on some of the sound bites that we've had through our industry for, for many years around collaboration and partnership. Um, and this, this does support that, I think, so it's a very timely one. Indeed, thank you. And Andy, if I could just come back to you about, I think you know some of the benefits have emerged from our discussion already, but just in summary, what would you say they are? Absolutely, Anne. Well, I think that one of the key benefits of the FM contract is that it brings closer alignment to the terminology and definitions that are typically used in the FM market and also that are evident in the international standard ISO 41001. Um, it's also the contract provides for the wide diversity of requirements of different organisations in the FM market and has the flexibility to adjust to accommodate these different requirements of, of a wide range of different organisations. Um, with the support of NEC, we have a deep pool of knowledge and expertise in procurement and contract management to draw on. 
and also it gives us stability and certainty in the way that parties involved in the contract are contractually bound. And finally, I think the contract allows us to build trust and collaboration, which is a key lesson for industry from the Carillion failure. Indeed, thank you. So we, we've talked about some of the, the similarities between the existing suite and the, the new um, FNC, but Ian, if I could come back to you, what are some of the differences that we will see um, between the two suites? Well, we have, um, and it's interesting, there's a question that's come through that's sort of related to this around why didn't um, RWFM create a new FM contract from scratch? Why take an NEC contract and sort of tweak it? Well, you know, I, I think in fairness, we did go back to first principles and say what elements of the NEC would be applicable and what would not be. And we changed it where we felt appropriate. So, you know, we thought we'd start with a, an existing template, but redesign it from the bottom up where necessary to reflect the requirements of the FM community. So we've retained some things, but then we've addressed some of the big ticket issues that people raised through the consultation process, through the feedback from the IWFM steering groups about what was needed. So a good example there is the service order process, where there was a lot of concern that there wasn't a simple way of calling off work. So maybe that's going to be reactive maintenance works there's going to be a need to call off through a help desk some additional activities and there, there was a feeling that there wasn't an automatic or a, a contractually contained process for that we had the works orders process but that was quite complicated more for mini construction projects than this general reactive maintenance call off type process so we've introduced service orders into the contract and a service order process. So allowing for that reactive maintenance to have a mechanism contractually for it to be called off as and when required, linking that through to the contents of the scope produced by the client to give the sort of detailed processes to support that. But we have a contractual mechanism to deal with that type of approach. That was one of the the fundamental changes that we made, given the feedback we had from the industry. Thank you for that. And I think one of the other key changes um, we see is the terminology that's used within the, the contracts, very much geared towards the FM sector rather than the construction sector. So we see things like service provider rather than contractor and projects and project orders rather than tasks and task orders and and that's something I was particularly delighted to see and I think it's worth us making clear that whilst we started with that con that template of, of NEC it wasn't simply a case of changing a few pieces of terminology it was much more fundamental than than that so we've also got a few things that have been um, moved as well um, Ian could you quickly run through a few of those for us, please? So I linked, uh, linked in many ways to the introduction of the service order process within the core clauses. We moved what used to be the task order process into a secondary option and identified that now as project orders. So there is still the ability to call off, if you like, mini projects, which may be, say, you know, the replacement or major refurbishment of some lifts. It could be an extension to an existing building. So we still have the ability to do that, but that is now a secondary option. So for those clients that don't want to do that type of work, who are going to use it for, you know, general FM type activities, um, they don't have to include that secondary option. So we try to simplify the contract. So again, we just have we haven't just added more in to make it ever increasingly complex and bulky we tried to take things out to leave them as options for people to select if they want them or they do not have to so that's probably one of the biggest changes the removal of the task order process having it as a secondary option identifying that now as a as a, as a separate optional process 
and linked to that we've also introduced some options around design having design responsibility dealing with design liability related to where there are those project orders and there may be therefore a necessary element of design to be included lovely thank you and um chris i could come to you about a particular aspect of the contract the performance table um, and I can see we've got a couple of questions about that already, but what should go in that performance table? What yeah, thanks, Anne. Absolutely. So, as any of us that have been involved in this sort of work in the past will understand, the specification and the performance table, uh, KPIs, are part of the, the real core of how a, an FM contract works. What this contract, this, this suite of contracts does not do, it doesn't set out what should be in the specification, what should be in the scope. It doesn't set out what should be in the specific KPIs because it can't do that because every client will have their own requirements around the scope and indeed what is important to them to measure related to that scope, the KPIs. There's been a lot of discussion and debate through this programme and indeed in our wider industry about, can't we have a, a sort of a boilerplate spec document for FM? I think it's more about the approach to the language that's taken, whether it's input or output, which I won't spend too much time talking about today, but it's more about understanding the right balance in that space. And indeed, as the industry's recently experiencing moving on to outcomes from a, from a contract. The benefit I think of about the way that this suite of contracts is set up is that it gives that flexibility. It does rely on the client team to be putting the, the actual detail and content into the scope and therefore the measures that, that come from that. But it also sets out very clearly where those documents should sit within the contract. How do you then approach the KPIs? Well, there is general guidance in the industry around KPIs and IWFM provide some um, guidance on that. And as Andy mentioned, we are putting together some NEC for FM contract suite specific practice notes and guidance notes. Some of those are done already, some of those are coming. And this is an area in which we will be providing some support and guidance. You can't mandate specifically what those measures would be. You can, though, give examples, and we'll be doing that. So we'll be saying if you have specific examples, sorry, specific reasons why you um, what you want to measure and what, what's contained in the scope, I'll give us some examples of, of what, um, what that would look like. And in the uh, guidance notes, the user guidance, on the second one, preparing a contract, uh, page 20 in section two, there is an example of the performance table in there. And that, I think, gives some guidance as to how the contract wants to, the, 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 the measures to be set out. There is some flexibility that can be taken on contract by contract basis, but it gives a, a good steer as to what that should look like. It gives an idea about what the measure is, how frequently it should be measured, um, who would do that measurement, and what the implication on pricing is. Uh, and it gives an example of uh, what it would look like under option C, target. So can't mandate it, but can give some good guidance on it. And the team will be doing that in terms of supporting material that's coming out to, um, to, to help our community understand how that element of the contract could be can be put together and so what we're trying to get to is we're trying to get to as more people use the contract the way in which these documents are put together becomes more uniform and more st more standardized um, as to the extent that it can be in terms of the scope of the KPIs. Thank you Chris and I, I think you make a, a good point that um, whatever contract terms and conditions we're dealing with we still need a really robust specification to, to go hand in hand with that and appropriate performance measures to, to support that. Chris if I could just stay with, with you, um, you and I both spend uh, a lot of time in our day jobs procuring services for clients how do you see this changing in the future with the new contract? Yeah, absolutely. A really important thing to, 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 to pause and think about. I think I touched at the top when we did our opening, um, our opening session around the need for there to be actual tangible evidence around trust in our community, around clients and contractors. And, and if we set out a particular set of standards, 
Will that be delivered on time to price? And indeed, will the contractor go that extra mile to be more accountable for work that might need to be done across the estate that is not necessarily in the contract, which is the sort of relationship that most clients want to have. The history, as we know, to FM is that one side or the other understands a contract better. And that can lead to challenges and problems over the life of the contract. It might be the client, it might be the provider. What we want to have is a much more of an open, transparent relationship and understanding about the contract, around what's in it, terms and conditions, around what needs to be delivered in the scope. And yes, we've touched on the fact that that needs to be specific to each contract. But again, if we're looking at a particular um, way of putting the contract together in the form of language, then over time, that will be more standardised completely. And I think that will lead to a, a better way of approaching procurements of FM contracts, because not only will the client team and all of the supporting um, team members that need to come together there, the legal team, the commercial team, procurement leads, they will have a, a better understanding or have more familiarity around NEC 4 FM. Some of them, of course, already have an understanding of NEC, but, but this is a specific FM contract. And so going into the procurement exercise, they will have more trust and more uh, confidence that what they're writing, just in the procurement process, will be understood by the market. And then coming the other way, from the bidder perspective, if they were to receive the NEC contract coming to them through a bid process, then they'll understand, again, where the balance of risk sits, what the pricing model is going to be, and indeed, as I say, the, the, the terms and conditions. So their legal teams, their commercial teams should be more comfortable with it. So I think it's about that balance of understanding the form of contract and knowing that the other party will also be on top of their game in terms of understanding the contract too. Super. So a, a fantastic start to a, a new contractual relationship by having that clarity and potentially building trust. Andy, can, can I ask how we, we sustain that though, how we sustain that sort of ongoing relationship between client and supplier? Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Sam. Um, I think with its alignment to the ISO 41000 series of standards, the new FM contract is intended to foster collaborative relationships uh, between customers and service providers. So opportunities for an adversarial approach to be taken are reduced as low as possible as most potential FM contract circumstances are considered and addressed in the new contract. Um, in the long term, also, hopefully, it will also lead to a trend towards longer, more sustainable contract terms, uh, which promote mutual investment in, for instance, equipment or learning and development, and also allows both parties to gain more from the contract relationship. Lovely. Thank you. And, and Ian, um, just coming back to our earlier point, how we get hold of a copy of the contract? Well, the contracts are available to order through the IWFM website, and I believe there's a discount for IWFM members on purchasing those. The NEC website, they can also be purchased through that route, and then there are other stockists that you can approach for them, but really through the NEC website, through the IWFM website is where you can get access to them. Um, the idea is they can be bought either hard copy or they can be in an electronic PDF form, um, again, depending on how much the client is going to use them or the, the service provider and whether they want to have the ability to actually um, change them, they can also be purchased in a Word format for um, allowing there to be changes made if necessary, though those do have to be flagged up and identified. But really, the purchase of the, the PDF versions, the hard copies, is through those websites, those locations. And maybe just a further point to raise on that, I think, you know, there's obviously a cost in purchasing these contracts, and that may to some users be seen as maybe a barrier to adoption, particularly maybe for the SMEs uh, operating in the industry. But I think it's worth understanding that you only have to buy one copy. You don't actually send a copy out with your tender documents or have a copy that is sort of signed and filled in and bound into the contract. You refer to it. And so once you buy a copy, that copy is going to, you know, live with you for the foreseeable future. You have 
the contract data, which contains the contract specific information that is produced on a contract by contract basis, but that's available as a Word document downloadable from the NEC. So you only have to buy the one copy for yourself as an individual, maybe to use within your organization. And you know, NEC contracts, we had NEC three to NEC four, that took about 15 years to move from one version to the next. The FM contracts are just issued now, so hopefully they're not gonna change in the next five, 10, potentially 15 years. And if there are amendments made to the contracts, you know, changes in legislation to deal with specific issues within them, then those are normally issued as free amendments to the users, to the people who've already purchased the contract. So whilst there's an initial cost, once you have a copy, that copy is going to do you for a substantial number of years into the future. Lovely. Thank you, Ian. Inevitably, there, there may be changes that are needed, as you mentioned about legislation. I can see we've had a question about that. But Andy, just finally, um, if you could share with us how, how we're going to make sure that the contract remains relevant and up to date and is promoted within the sector. Absolutely. Um, well, first, first of all, um, for IWM members and um, purchasers of the contracts, as um, Chris mentioned, a suite of practice notes is being drawn up uh, by the IWFM steering group, which will be reviewed regularly and changed or added to as developments in the market or members' demands require. Um, under the new IWFM NEC Memorandum of Understanding, um, an FM contract forum is going to be established, uh, which will maintain the um, FM contract so we can ensure that we pick up on any industry trends and ensure that the contract remains fit for purpose. And finally, of course, uh, training is available from NEC or via IWFM uh, so that we can ensure that the way that the contract is used is also consistent. That's, that's super. So thanks everybody for, for your insights into uh, the development, the usage and, and and some of the content of the um, FMC. Um, I'd like to move over to um, our audience questions now, if I may. Um, we're get, getting a lot of questions in. So what I would say is, if there's any that we're not able to answer during the webinar, we do have the opportunity to respond afterwards to you. But I just want to start um, just on a technical aspect. Um, Ian, um, there's a couple of questions here, one from uh, Gavin Ogg and another from Fred Syed, uh, sort of related, works projects are commonly procured through an FM provider or contract as a variable service, but the contract terms are not entirely aligned or appropriate, so how does a new FM contract handle works projects or minor works projects? Oh, I think you're on mute, Ian. Apologies for that. The classic uh, forget to unmute. Uh, yeah, so uh, just going back to what I was saying to myself, um, we have the secondary option X27 that deals with what we now call the um, project orders. So this allows us to instigate a project, a mini project, and contains the relevant procedures and processes necessary to enable that to happen. So we do have the mechanism within the contract to call off, you know, projects of work under the FM contract. You have the service order process again, which could be used for maybe some of the smaller, simpler additional elements of work, but then the project orders for those activities that require a program that have a level of interfacing, that have a start and finish dates that needs to be worked to. So we tried to capture within that secondary option the necessary processes and procedures required. And again, as I touched on earlier, we've also introduced some other, other secondary options around things like design. So service providers design, 
dealing with where they're having to put a design input as part of that project order process, how that will work. So hopefully we've taken an existing sort of task order process from the um, term service contract, expanded it and improved it to allow it to be used under the FM contracts. Lovely, thank you. Chris, Andy, anything you want to add to that? I think uh, I think Ian's probably covered that. I think it, it's it's a really valid point though because it's one of those areas that it, it happens in, in in most FM contracts, particularly over a certain size, uh, in, in terms of value. Um, how project works have been managed in the past has not always been transparent, and I think that's what what Gavin was alluding to there. And it's become a bit of a bolt on. We want this to be much more of a partnership relationship so that all of the work that's in scope, potentially in scope, the FM delivery partner becomes the sort of default organisation to deliver that. And I'm well aware that historically there are challenges with that and there are performance issues with that. But we want to think about what the best solution, the best optimum service delivery for a facilities management service is in the future. And it should be encompassing that because it touches so closely on the alignment of data and information, information that's related to the management of the whole estates management model. So I think it's, I think it's really important that the model deals with that satisfactorily. And we, we, we think we've got the, the mechanics in the contract to do that. Lovely, thank you, Chris. And actually, if I could stick with you, Chris, um, and then I'll ask the, the other two panelists for their views. There's an, a question here of saying that FM services vary hugely in size. And what would we see the sort of typical maximum annual value of these contracts being? <laughs> so that's an easy one and a not so easy one. So an easy one in the sense that you, you can't really say because it, it, it depends on the sector, depends on the scope. It depends on what the specific requirements are of, of FM within the whole um, needs requirements of the business. So, for example, IT, sometimes IT is quite closely aligned, but usually it's not within the same service bundle of contracts. So what I would say, though, is that because of the different um, types of contract we have within the suite, there is a specific contract form for different value uh, thresholds. So we would. If I was to really be pressed on it, I would say up to about a million is probably where you would get to on the short form. But again, it does depend on whether that's all just one service, whether that's integrated services, depends what's needed really. So I, I don't think perhaps a, a more positive way of answering it is, I don't think there's any uh, form of contract that is uh, excluded in terms of, in terms of value. This, the, the suite that we've got here should be able to deal with um, any financial threshold level, if that makes sense. Thank you. Andy, did you want to add anything? Uh, yes, thanks, Alan. I'd, I'd just like to echo what Chris has said. And um, as he pointed out, this, the short contract is available for um, those services which are they sort of are potentially lower value, but also are relatively simple and low risk. Uh, more complex agreements involving multiple services, um, higher values and consequently a higher level of risk for either party um, are better dealt with by the main contract but across the suite of contracts I think there is there is a contract mechanism to um, cover all eventualities and all values. Thank you and then um, Ian if I could just return to you there's several questions here about what people will get when they buy the suite of contracts. So what's included? So I think there's flexibility over what people do actually purchase. I think they can buy individual contracts. They can provide the guidance for those specific contracts. So they could purchase the FMC, the facilities management contract, the main contract as a single document. They could then purchase the user guides that accompany that particular contract or they can buy the suite, the entire collection of contracts. So the idea being you can pick and mix what you want to purchase to suit your particular requirements. And so, as I said earlier, the idea is that you buy a copy of the contract, 
you then have that yourself to refer to when you're managing or operating a contract that's been procured under it, using the contract data to create the specific contractual arrangement between the parties. So you don't have to buy multiple copies. Obviously, if, if people in your organization want to copy each or you want a licensed version that allows multiple people to access it, there's different pricing regimes for that. Best thing I can advise is to contact the NEC via their website or go through the IWFM website to get a hold of the pricing information, speak to the NEC about the purchase um, options and how those contracts can be, can be you know, um, how you can gain access to the different contracts. Lovely, thank you. And then I can see a couple of questions um, and I'll start with you, Andy, on this about during the development process, how did we engage with the, the market um, for their views on the contract? Well, certainly um, in the initial uh, working group, we engaged uh, representatives from customer organisations, from service providers, and also from specialists such as consultants and niche service providers. Uh, so we got a wide range of inputs from across the industry, uh, both within the UK and also those with international reach. Um, and then the steering group, which was appointed by IWFM to work with NEC from 2018, included representatives from, again, varied um, organisations. We had um, consultants, we had um, client side FM representatives and also service providers. So there was input from across the range of industry. And I think that the output does reflect the, the needs of all parties. Lovely. Anybody want to, to add to that? Okay. Um, there's a question here. Uh, we touched on earlier about changes that may happen. So, um, Ian, if I could turn to you, doesn't appear to be a mechanism to transfer risk to the FM contractor for foreseeable legislative changes, such as changes in national living wage, minimum wage, landfill tax where would we see that within the, the contract so in the standard contract the risk of legislative change actually sits with the service provider as a default though through the selection of a secondary option x2 the client can choose to take the risk of changes in legislation after the contract has been awarded so there is the option of allocating that risk either to the client or the service provider through the inclusion or not of the secondary option. And that works on the basis of a change rather than a foreseeable change, because as soon as you words, use words like foreseeable, you're into maybe a debate, a discussion, what should have been foreseen, what should not have been foreseen. So we take a more straightforward view, which is, a change in legislation post to this date is either the client's risk or the supplier's risk, depending upon whether or not that secondary option has been selected. There's always the option for users to amend the contract if they wish, you know, and there may be reasons why specific amendments may be necessary. We'd always caution that that is done in a very considered manner and whether it's actually better to include some of these um, additional requirements as part of the scope than as changes to the contract. But again, clients can choose to further refine that particular issue if they wish within the contract. But we do have an option to allocate the risk of changes post the contract date to one party or the other. Lovely. Thank you, Ian. And then, um, Chris, if I can come to you, there's a question regarding the simplified service order process, how will it comply with public procurement regulations, public contracting regulations? I know you do a lot of work in the public sector. Yeah, I saw that question. Yeah, thanks, Anne. Um, my initial reaction to that is why would it not comply? Because I I'm, I'm perhaps need a little bit more from the, um, the person who answered the question in terms of what, what, what they mean by that, because there isn't anything in here anything that we've considered through the development of the documents that would 
get in the way that will be a challenge or preclude from that sort of work or context. So I'm, I'm sorry, I, I did see it and I was thinking, I'm not sure what, what the context of that means really. Ian, I don't know if you can, can, can sort of provide a bit more of a further answer to that. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can offer a view around that. And again, you know, it's often helpful to get maybe a bit more context to the question, but you know, the idea of the contracts is, is they only come into existence upon agreement, upon award. How you get to the award is going to be governed largely by a client's own tender process that has to comply with any relevant legislation. There is guidance around how you prepare the contract, how you engage a supplier within the user guides, but it's relatively generic given that it's for these contracts are for use anywhere in the world under any governing legislation. So that tender process isn't really covered in detail within the contracts because obviously that's that's finished, that's done. By the time we come to sign on the dotted line, create the contract, and the contract then manages the interface between the parties from that point forward. Though, so, you know, again, that's probably something that may be addressed, I suspect, in some of the use, some of the practice notes some of the additional guidance that may be produced by IWFM, the NEC or others in relation to how these contracts can be used within those processes. Yeah, it's probably just worth uh, just adding to that. So as some of us may be aware, there is a consultation at the moment around changes to ECR 2015, the public contract regs. When we know exactly what that looks like, we would no doubt be putting a response through the, um, the steering group that's being set up for this contract. Uh, in terms of how this contract responds to that. But I, again, I, I don't see, just building on what Ian was saying now, I don't see a conflict in any way. It has to be applied for the particular region, the particular country it's being used in, as Ian says, so it shouldn't be a problem. Thank you both. Um, Andy, there's a question here about how will the success and the quality of the new contracts be measured over time? I, th I think um, you know, certainly through the um, level of, of use, um, so the, con the contract com becoming the default uh, means of procurement and contracting services across the market. Um, I think it is certainly is a step change in um, terms of having a contract which is fit for purpose for the industry. Uh, so hopefully that will very much be become the case. And also um, the prevalence of um, successful long-term contract relationships rather than time-limited um, short-term contracts based solely on cost. I think sort of the focus on collaboration, quality and um, addressing the needs of all parties will really sort of contribute to the success of this contract. Thank you. Thanks. We've got a question about sustainability. Um, I'll ask um, Ian, if I may, the first part, that does the contract address sustainability at all? OK, uh, it, it's a good question. And, you know, I'm going to answer it maybe in a broader way and then come back to the specific. And really, it picks up on something Chris was saying earlier, that the idea of these contracts is they can be used for any type of service anywhere in the world. And so they act as a as a mechanism, a set of procedures and processes to give life to the scope and the specific service requirements of the client. And so that allows you to build into the scope, the performance table, other documents, what the supplier has to achieve, you know, what the service provider is required to do, the standards to be achieved in doing so. So you can include sustainability requirements within the scope, and then the service provider has to comply. If they don't, it's going to be a service failure. It's going to be addressed through that process, normally with some sort of financial implication or a need to put right what hasn't been done. But then you've got the performance table as a way of incentivizing potentially better performance. And so in the performance table, you could provide targets around net zero. You could look at you know, carbon reduction or carbon usage targets. They may be aspirational, and those can be included in the performance table with some sort of reward regime if they're achieved or bettered. So you know, it comes back to the inherent flexibility of the contract structure 
to include within the scope, the performance table and elsewhere, what it is the client wants the service provider to do and you know any constraints or any things then they, they, they can bring to the table in addition. You know, things like social value, targets around that can form part of the scope must be done or part of the aspirational element of the performance table. You know, we'd like you to do this in addition. We will reward you if you do, possibly penalise if you don't. But again, there's the inherent flexibility for it to either be positive or negative or a combination of the two. And again, I'll let obviously Chris and Andy speak in a moment, but I believe this is another area that is being targeted through the various practice notes. You know, how do you incorporate social value, sustainability into the relevant parts of the contract to, you know, encourage incentivized performance against them? Yeah, so just thank you for, for that, Ian. And um, the, the question was from Jonathan Hulbert, and I'll, I'll just ask Chris if you've got any insight on how we can embed sustainability into FM contracts. So I'll ask yourself, and then I'll wrap up by asking Andy the same question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll be as succinct as I can. So much to say in this space. Lots going on in this particular space at the moment. I think the point I'd want to quickly get across now, and hopefully everybody's on board with this, that's thinking about the requirements set out, as Ian says, in the scope documents. Sustainability should not be something that comes towards the end. Uh, do all of these requirements and look after my estate and do all the maintenance to my assets. And then also you've got to have a sustainability manager or uh, perform all your services sustainably. It needs to be much more intrinsic through the whole delivery of the service. And what we should be looking for is everything that's in scope, whatever service it is, needs to have a specific sustainability measure against it. And that's what I would be looking for in uh, the, the contracts that we should be putting in place in the future. So, of course, it needs to match the client's obligations and the client's requirements in that space. And there would be another document that would be referenced in terms of what the scope needs to set out but it needs to be intrinsically built in to the whole service that's delivered. And we are doing a lot of work in that space. My WFM have just, just, um, just earlier this year actually published a guidance in, in cooperation with Syria, I can get this wrong, Construction Industry Research and Information Association. I think I've got that right. And um, we did quite a bit of work there to put together a sustainable FM practice guide. So that's also on the website. Um, so that gives a bit of guidance there too. Thank you. Chris. And Andy, if I could just finish, if there's any final comments from yourself. Yes, thanks, Anne. I, th I think I'd like to ex echo what Ian and Chris have said. And I think because um, so whatever, whatever the scope of services, um, the FM provider is often um, key to the way that a organisation operates their estate and to managing their um, carbon footprint. So with so many organizations now focusing on sustainability and particularly setting net zero targets, then the, the importance of a collaborative relationship between customers and FM service providers has never been more key. Lovely, thank you. Thank you again for um, everyone for sending their questions in and for our panelists' uh, responses as well and their insight. Um, so just to, um, wrap up on the, the webinar. I hope that you've all got a better idea now about how the contract was developed, some of the aspects that were included, and also the benefits that it will bring to our sector. So anybody interested in, in actually buying the contract or indeed training, there are discounts available to IWFM members. Um, you can contact the IWFM membership team in order to get your discount code. And then just a call out to anybody out there who might be interested in being part of the future FM forum that will help keep the FMC relevant and fit for purpose. And if you're interested, again, contact the policy team at IWFM. Finally, um, just a call out, so if you haven't already completed the IWFM survey, um, there's still time. Um, the closing date is the 2nd of July this year. 
We've also got um, coming up later in the year, the IWFM conference on the 13th of September. And not forgetting that there's loads of resources, not only the recordings of these Navigating Turbulent Time webinars, but lots of other resources aimed at supporting FM professionals. So I just want to close by thanking our panellists, Andy, Ian and Chris. Thank you for the IWFM team for all of your support in the background and to thank all of you for joining us today. Take care. Bye bye everyone. Thank you.